Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender I will make room for you to do whatever you want to do whatever you want to and I will make room for you for you to do whatever you want to do whatever
Hey, that was so good. You ladies really sing well together. And that's a great song, one of my favorite songs. Uh, welcome to Calvary. It, it is our 10th CWOW Sunday. And if you don't know what CWOW stands for, it is Church Without Walls. And every fourth Sunday of the month, starting back last April, um, rather than gathering in person at the church, we go out to be the church. We go out to love our neighbors so we don't come here, we scatter to be the church. And pray for our neighbors and love them, invite them into our space. In fact, you might be watching this because um, you're a neighbor um, and, and you've been invited by somebody from Calvary to connect with us online, which is so cool. And which is also why if at any point you want to have a conversation about Jesus, um, we, we would love to connect with you. Just shoot us an email at dan at calvarysc.org, dan at calvarysc.org. We'd love, we'd love to connect. And, and meanwhile, welcome. Um, this is Lynn, my wife, and uh, she's kind of the, the heart of our family and the heart of the Calvary family. And uh, every CWOW Sunday, we just spend a little bit of time together with you talking about what's going on in our life and, and a little bit of what's going on in Calvary's life. It's been a little while since we've been together. Yeah, so Well, not us together. Yeah, well, it's been a little while yes. since we've been together, but... <laughs> Not as long as it's been since we've done a CWOW Sunday. We didn't do the one in December, yeah. so it's actually been November. So catch so us up a little bit on what's been going on for us. Well, first I'm curious, when you say I'm the heart of the family, does that mean you're the brains of the family? Well, <laughs> that, that, that the... almost goes without saying. <laughs> okay, I asked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want so, me to be the heart and you be the brains? Right, that we can do well. that. That wouldn't work well. Um, well, since we last met, we would have had Christmas. Christmas Eve, yep. Christmas Eve at Calvary, that was and Christmas. awesome. Christmas Eve at Calvary and Christmas, yep. our family. Um, we did not have. We only had one of our kids home for this Christmas. Next Christmas, we'll have them all. Um, they all went to the in-laws. Yep. We did Christmas with my side of the family who live in Pennsylvania. Right. And um, then Dan and Sarah and I did a trip to warm weather. We went to Orlando, which was awesome. So I, th I th think we have a picture of that. Yeah. And I don't know. What else have we done? I think that's I I that's almost won the lottery. No, that was fake. That was fake. <laughs> we... Listen to SDG on if you want more details of that one. Well, <laughs> just a little bit. I'll share. We we did a. Sharing they call it Norwegian <laughs> Norwegian gift exchange in Lynn's family, and and so it's one of those. You know, somebody opens up, somebody elephant, else can sit, steal Norwegian it. Yeah, because they're Norwegians, and and uh, so so Lynn's brother Jimmy got this gift, and it was you know some candy and a ten dollar gift card to Dunkin' Donuts, and then a big huge honking lottery ticket, and and. Uh, I, I can't buy lottery tickets. I told God I wouldn't buy lottery tickets unless he told me I had. I try to get, but she won't either. <laughs> and so I knew that I had to steal that gift. So I stole that gift, and 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 everybody kind of goes on to their thing. It couldn't be stolen again. And, and so I just kind of slowly started kind of scratching off the stuff, and it was like, oh my goodness, I I, I match it. It's twenty five thousand dollars, and so I'm taking it around to other people in the room just. Just quietly, I don't want to make a big deal yet. Just say, "Look at this. Does this is this right?" And everybody's going, "Yeah, it looks looks yeah. right to me." And meanwhile, someone in the room, I didn't realize it was a person who had bought the gift, is is kind of like going, "Finish it, finish it." And there was like three little extra little deals down at the bottom, and and you know another chance to win. And I and so I scratched them off, and one of them said, "Like, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gag gift." <laughs> I felt so stinking. I was going to give all that money to the one percent fund, <laughs> and and uh, so I kind of made the person who gave it feel a little bad because I was so excited about winning excited the lottery. About it. 
But we didn't win the lottery, um, but we had a good Christmas. Christmas. It was a good Christmas. We had Italian food instead of our traditional ham or turkey, and it was really good. They had it catered in, so no one had to do any work for the food. Not no work, but that was great. So, and then um, some some updates on the kids, grandkids. The the kind of funny thing, I think, is is Hawk is... That, that's our, our grandson, middle kid, and he's just starting to do the whole big boy bed thing. Yep. And he, so it was probably three nights ago, I got, Sarah and I got a long text from Katie in the morning with... Um, kind of a rundown. A rundown of her night. So it's... His first night. I mean, it's night, a little long, but I'll read it night. fast because, yeah. of course, we're the grandparents, so we think yeah. it's hysterical. But It is pretty funny, It is though. funny. So at 12.20, so a little after midnight, Rory came into their room and Katie told her, Rory, you were excited to sleep with Hawk. Why are you here? So for the first time, she could crawl into his bed instead of their bed. And she said he was laying across the whole bed so there wasn't room for her. So she slid into bed with Katie. 12.45, Hawkins starts screaming. And so she goes in there and he doesn't want to be alone. So she she brought in Rory (laughs) to sleep with him. And... Um, she, Rory was asleep, so she picked her up, plopped her in bed, and she woke up, and she said Rory she was livid. And she asked how long she's supposed to lay with Hawk. And I said, go to sleep. And she said, I'm supposed to sleep here? I can't do this forever. <laughs> so Katie said, neither can I. Go to bed here or in your room, but not mine. She tried to leave again, and Hawk started to cry because he wanted his mama. So she laid there till 1.30 in the morning. And then 145 went back into her room. She heard a noise, a brief noise, but fell back to sleep. And then at 2 a.m., Rory came in and asked if they can have their iPads. 2 a.m. <laughs> so Katie said no. And Rory said, oops. And she went in. Katie went into the room to find they already had their iPads. And they had actually put a cover over. There's a picture of Hawk, and that's their camera, the security cover camera. To, the security to look. Camera. So she covered the camera so that she couldn't see her, but apparently guilt made her go in and ask so katie put their ipads away she begged them to please go to sleep they slept from about 3 a.m till 6 45 in the morning so big boy bed was not really a great experiment for the first night but hopefully no, he's doing a little bit better two nights went better and i think rory actually stayed more in her bed because the thought of having to sleep with hawk was worse than the thought of sleeping in her own bed so it may be will work out well in the we'll end. See. We'll, we'll see. see. And there's so much good stuff happening at, at Calvary. Um, this, this weekend is Seawell Sunday. Um, so we don't gather in the morning on, on Seawell Sunday. But, but this week, um, different from any other Seawell Sunday, we're, we're doing flood together. I'm excited about um, that. A Calvary-wide flood, inviting anybody. It, you can join us in person at Harvest Fields or online. We're finishing up the 50 Days of Hope, if, if you've been joining us with that. And, and closing it out with seven days of prayer, intentional, even hopefully extraordinary prayer. Um, our focus for Seawall Sunday is praying for our neighbors, and then we're going to gather together that evening at 6 o'clock. Um, online, if, if you join us that way, it'll be at live.calvarysc.org, and uh, otherwise we'll be in person. We're going to have a great time. Looking forward Looking to, forward to worshiping and sharing some hope stories and praying together and stuff like that. So and I'm pretty sure we'll be prayer driving, not prayer we'll- prayer walking because the cold is mm, I'll be prayer driving not prayer walking. We'll see. No, I won't see. I already know. We'll see. It has been decided. We'll let you know whether we prayer walked or prayer drove. uh, We'll let you know what he did. Stop. I'm telling you I'm prayer driving. (laughs) And another great thing that has happened at Calvary, give you a little bit of an update on, is our 1% offering. Talked about that a lot during the, the course of December. And honestly, to be honest, coming um, to the end of December, I was a little bit discouraged, thought we weren't going to make our goal. Our goal was $240,000, and uh, um, we we ended up, we're, we're pretty close to $260,000 right now, which is really amazing. Last year was our high point in one, the 1% offering, but that was in part because we had a, a last-minute $75,000 matching gift, which really bumped yeah. us up, but... But two hundred sixty thousand this year is is so good, and and it's going to go to help so many different people. Um, common food, helping to feed people in in the area. Um, it we'll, we'll use it. We'll be able to do one of those food packing things um, this year, um, aiming for about two hundred forty thousand meals this time. Um, so there's so many things. The Myanmar folks, it it, it helps a ton. So thank you so much. 
um, for your generosity to the 1% offering. And, and then another thing taking place at Calvary, which is a good news in the midst of, of the hard news. Um, if, if you were with us, you know, uh, last weekend, we talked about this a little bit at church, um, that, that last week, week before last, uh, a young guy from Calvary who was a part of the Calvary family, one of our, our extreme youth ministry leaders, uh, Matt McDonald, took his life. And so, you know, we've, we've really been wrestling with some of that um, throughout uh, the, the last couple of weeks. Last weekend, if you joined us both online and in person, we, we took a, a bit of a survey. And, and the survey basically said, um, have you or a close friend, and then we had a list of about seven things. And you can see the survey online. Uh, the one that we took online is, is, is on the screen now. But it was stuff like, have you or, or a close friend ever wrestled or struggled with depression? 78% 78, 78 of the people said, um, yeah, e either myself or a close friend ha has struggled with depression. Um, ha have you or a close friend ever lived with a deep, um, life-altering fear or anxiety? 62% said, yeah, I, I or, or a close friend have, have lived with that. Uh, addiction um, or chronic illness, uh, life-ending illness, 50% of the people. And, and there was a number of other ones. And, and basically, in the in-person meetings, we had people stand um, if they represented any of those um, groups of people. And it was basically everybody yeah. um, who, who ended up standing. And so we're, we're going to be doing some stuff in the coming weeks to try to um, increase our capacity to walk alongside and, and be hope givers for folks who are going through rough times. So be watching for that. One of the first things we'll, we'll do will be an assessment um, a, a survey just to get a sense of not not so much what are people going through, but how are we doing as a church in being a place that welcomes and serves and loves folks who are really walking through hard times. So last weekend we we talked a little bit about that even in the message. What does it look like to be somebody who can help others walk through hard times? And and this weekend actually that's uh, in, in a sense part two of, of that message as well. So today in the teaching time I'm sharing a story about a time when Jesus was going through a, a time of, of deep loss and grief and uncertainty. And so he, he tried to get alone to kind of spend some time with God to gain some, some uh, perspective. Um, so I, just to kind of lead us off into the message, Lynn, what, what have you done? What, uh, what has helped you when you go through difficult times of grief and, and uncertainty? Well, I think that as when you share that the story, I think Jesus is a perfect ex example of what we should do. I think our tendency mm. is to retreat, yeah. to withdraw, to cut people off, and I think um, you know that's part of that's part of the battle. Is is grieving is very personal. Grieving is um, can be a really long process. Grieving looks different for every one of us, and so I think there are times that we feel like my grief might overpower someone mm. else. And so I'm just going to hold on to, to it myself. And over and over, we, we find that when we re-engage and yeah. even focus on other people, look at, for me, it's looking for beauty, even yeah. in the midst of, of loss. You know, the most horrific trauma grieving, I think, that ever took place in history was Jesus' death on the cross. Yeah. And yet we can look and see the beauty that came from that story that came from that truth, that reality of what Jesus did for us. And so, you know, I think there there always is that needed period of pulling back for a little bit, even just to get perspective, to catch yeah, our own yeah. breath and and look at, at life. But if we don't re-engage at some point and look for the beauty and, and I with think people and with, with God. people and with God. And I think that um looking for the beauty ourselves when we're going through grief or trauma. Mm -hmm. Is really hard. We we need that perspective of community, and we need to be vulnerable. We need to not buy into the narrative that my grief is going to be too hard. It's not like other people have to bear our grief, but right. to walk with someone through it is a beautiful thing. And and you know, again, that's part of community. It's not one person where the burden's on one person, but together we're carrying each other through difficult times and and looking for those places when we can see, look ahead and see beauty, that mm. gives us hope. Yeah. If we can't see any beauty in the story coming up, then I think it causes us to lose hope. And yeah. God's created us to desire and look for beauty 
Um, so, I, you know, I, I can't say that I've gone through it. I've not gone through a, a death of a family member yeah. at this point, except for our niece many years ago. Yeah. But I think all of us are going through a season of grief just with COVID yeah. and the ways that that's changed and, and impacted our world. And, yeah. and we all respond to that differently. Um, and and it's caused this force isol- like isolation for some I think the more that we can break through that and grab onto community, the healthier we can walk through it. It's good. It's good. We're going to look at, at a story of a young boy um, who found community and, and I think even found some beauty in the midst of, uh, of the hardship. So Lynn, why don't you pray for us as we go into the message time? Father, thank you that you are a good father all the time. You are good and you understand our grief. You understand our trauma. You understand the ways that the enemy tries to use that against us, the ways the enemy would try to keep us isolated and alone. And yet you've created us for beauty. You've created us for beauty in our relationship with you and for beauty in our relationship with others. And so, God, for every person out there that's hearing this that feels this deep sense of trauma or grief and they're walking through it in isolation, God, I pray that they would reach out and find community that you would be their community in the moment, but that you would also put community with flesh on, um, people that can just come around them and and love them and and walk with them through it. We pray for for those who just even recently, the McDonald family and others who have suffered Mm -hmm. tremendous loss and grief. And God, it's a beautiful thing to watch community come around people um, who are dealing with that. And so I, I thank you, you see each one Um, You can bring so much fullness. You can multiply so much more our healing um, when we do it together with you and um, with community. Um, So thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you are at work, for all the beauty that you bring into um, each one of our lives. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, welcome to Calvary's online gathering. Regardless of where you are or even when you are, I'm really glad to be able to connect a bit with you today. And can I just say off the bat, you matter to God. Jesus loves you more than you know. The Spirit of God is hovering over the chaos of your life, working above and beyond you in ways that you can't even see. And whether you find yourself right now in the updraft of a great season or you are so weary of a hard and seemingly hopeless time, I'm telling you the best is yet to come because there's more of Jesus for you. There's more than enough Jesus for every hunger of your heart and every hope of your life. He is more than enough. And and I'm praying that in the next few moments, you'll have a sense of his hope multiplying in your heart. I love this story. John Bechtel lived in Hong Kong, a city where as many as 5,000 people might live in a single high-rise building on one acre of land. And, And so many of the people there lived with a daily deficit of hope. Along with a handful of other people, John began to get this hope cramp for the kids who lived in these high-rise concrete villages. And slowly, this vision began to form. They wanted to develop a camp where kids could get out into nature and meet God. They, they found out that there was a company that had built a facility for a million dollars, and the company said they would sell this facility to John Bechtel and his group for $250,000. What an amazing deal. One of, one of John's friends, colleagues, said, you know, I'll try to do some fundraising on the side. And for months he worked at it, but he got nothing. Either no one caught the vision, or if they caught it, they didn't have any money to give. In three months of fundraising, he received one letter. That one letter was from a little girl in Georgia named Melinda Holmes. And she wrote, please find my ice cream money for two weeks and closed. Please use it to help buy a camp for young people in Hong Kong. There was $1 inside the envelope. That's all they got. Do you ever feel that in a world racked by million dollar problems, about a dollar is all you have to give? 
that in a dorm apartment uh, filled with lonely, anxious, depressed people about an hour would drain your hope dry, that in a neighborhood built with the nicest of homes, your encouragement is a little bit less than a drop of hope in a sea of brokenness. But when it comes to our front yard mission, when it comes to our desire to be hope givers and love our neighbors, isn't that at least one reason why we're reluctant to open our doors and step into the mess? I think we have this uneasy sense that I simply do not have what's needed. I don't have enough. Come on, Dan, you, you gotta understand that, right? I mean, God understands. Can't give what I don't have. God, don't, don't ask me to forgive that neighbor. I, I can't give what I don't have. You, you can't ask me to be their friend. I mean, their needs are so deep. I, I just don't have enough time. I don't have enough heart. You, you know what it would cost my family, my kids? You, you can't expect me to share Jesus with them. I, I can't face the rejection. Not at a very good place. Can't give what I don't have. This is Siwao Sunday at Calvary, and it's also the end of our 50 Days of Hope. Siwao um, stands for Church Without Walls. So on Siwao Sunday, rather than encouraging people to leave their neighborhoods and go to church in, inside the walls, we encourage the church to stay where they are and love their neighbors. Be the church rather than go to church. And this particular weekend, we are encouraging an, an outpouring of prayer for our neighbors all over Central PA and beyond. Wherever you're at, everywhere we gather, there will be or have been people prayer walking or prayer driving, praying for their hashtag, asking God to multiply and pour out hope. But every CY weekend, we also provide this online experience to encourage you. So in this episode, we're going to look at a conversation that Jesus had with a bunch of people, a crowd, <laughs> his team, and a young boy. And if there's one message that comes from this conversation, perhaps it's these five words. There is more than enough. There's more than enough. That was John Bechtel's story. At the end of three months, his friend told John, all we've got is a dollar. John said, well, okay, I'll give it a try. And so just picture this. He walks into the company and says, we didn't quite come up with $250,000. If that's the need, we don't have enough. Well, how much do you have, they asked. I've got a dollar, he said, and he told the story of the little girl's ice cream money, gave them the envelope with a dollar, and somehow that one dollar offer traveled all the way back to the board where the answer was, well, you know what, if the camp is going to be used to help kids, we'll sell it to you for a dollar. Today that dollar is framed in the camp as a reminder of what God can do with the smallest of sacrifices. John Orberg relates that over a million kids have attended the camp. Over a hundred thousand kids have made a first-time decision to follow Jesus. They got to know Jesus at this camp and it all started with a one dollar gift. Listen to those five words again. There is more than enough. God is the God of more than enough. So we're going to look at a $1 more than enough story from Jesus' life. And from this story, I really just want to give us four requests, the four requests of a hope giver's prayer. Now, this story is the only one of Jesus' miracles to make it into all four of the Gospel of Counts. And, and by the time we get to the end of the story, I will suggest to you that as you go on a mission to be hope givers, that our God is more than enough. I'm going to focus primarily on John's rendition of the story in the Gospel of John, but we'll start with Matthew because he has some context that's important. So we head to Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 16, and here's what it says. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone, but the crowds heard where he was headed and followed him from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. <laughs> as soon as Jesus heard the news, is what what Matthew says, as soon as he heard the news, he wanted to be alone. What was the news? What had happened? Well, it was, it was hard stuff, hope-draining stuff. In fact, that morning, Jesus woke to re a report about the death of John the Baptist, his cousin, perhaps even a close friend, a ministry partner. John had been killed by Herod as a gift for his niece, who was the daughter of his brother's wife, Herodias, with whom he was having an affair. And not only that, but 
but Herod is probably coming after Jesus as well. It's a time of, of great uncertainty and a hope draining kind of time. It's a time of loss. And, and Jesus, you can just imagine, he's struggling, he's grieving, he's discouraged, maybe even a little bit angry. He was human like that. And he realizes that he needs to get away, clear his head, get alone with God, spend some time in prayer. What he needs to do is regain the Father's perspective on his circumstances, on what's going on in his life. When the days are difficult and darkness seems to be winning the battle, when the suffering seems unfair and you, and you can't help but ask why, it's like that's all you can ask. It is so vital to gain God's sovereign perspective. And I don't know what you're going through right now, but I do know that our circumstances will drain hope from our hearts if we can't get God's perspective. And life is, is not nearly so uncertain from God's perspective because he's, he's more than enough. Jesus was trying to get alone with God, but the crowd couldn't leave him alone. And honestly, I don't think it's all that different today. We can work our systems and systematize our programs. We can give you all the tools we can find to love your neighbors and, and resource your block party. But if Jesus shows up, you can't keep the people away. When you read through the Gospels, it seems like Jesus always drew a crowd. And I don't know, I just wonder perhaps the main reason crowds today are skeptical about the church isn't because of our voting record or, or our doctrine or our stands on social justice issues. Perhaps, I don't know, perhaps they just aren't sure we know where to find Jesus. Jesus got out of the boat, he saw the crowd, and he had compassion on them. In fact, the translation, he had compassion, is actually a little bit weak. Like, just imagine Jesus pulling into his driveway, having compassion on his neighbor, but still using the remote so that he can pull into the garage without ever having to see the need. Because I can have compassion on someone without doing something for them, right? I mean, there's mess in our neighborhoods into which we will never step because you can't give what you don't have, but it doesn't mean I don't have compassion, but, but Matthew uses the Greek word planksnitsomai. <laughs> Love that word. He uses that to describe Jesus' compassion. And, and that Greek word literally meant a sensation in the guts. Like this was a heartbreaking, head spinning, gut wrenching feeling. Not just silent tears, but groans of anguish that prompted action. He, he didn't just have compassion, he was moved with compassion. Because people matter to Jesus, they still do, all people. Every label we can devise, every sin represented, every brokenness imagined, every prideful, I've got it under control, don't need you person in your neighborhood, people who wear their brokenness on the outside and people who hide it on the inside, lost people who ridicule your faith. Jesus says right now, I, I want you to see them through my heart. They're not projects or political labels or enemies, they're people. They're like sheep without a shepherd is how Mark described them. And and Jesus says, I, I love them. Now, the disciples, on the other hand, as evening came, they're asking Jesus to send the people away. Enough is enough, and we don't have enough. Send them away, Jesus, so that they can get food and we can get rest. We need a, we need a little quarantine time. And Jesus saw sheep without a shepherd, and he was moved with compassion. The disciples saw needs without resources, and they were moved to look the other way. See, here, here's the deal. A scarcity mentality will drain my heart and a lack of compassion will blind my eyes. The disciples have a scarcity mentality. They've, they've lived a long time with hunger and, and they know that they don't have the resources to meet the needs of this crowd, this huge crowd. And when I don't think I have enough to meet the needs that I'll see, if I look, then my tendency is to just look away. Which brings me to our first hope giver prayer request. God, would you give me a compassion that moves me? Would you give me a compassion that moves me? Give me a heart that won't let me look away. Just like Jesus. He, he, could, have, he could have just said, Father, I can't give them what I don't have. I'm, I'm hurting, Father God. You, you know what happened to John. I, I just... Not, not now, God, maybe later. I just don't have enough in me right now. But instead, Jesus realized that God has more than enough. We'll see it again in John's rendition of the story, starting in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Here's what it says. 
Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him and turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He says he was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. And Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Literally, Philip said, it will take 200 denarii, Jesus. And, and a denarius was about a day's wages for a common laborer. It'll, it'll take seven months' wages, Jesus. In other words, Jesus, if you want me to make a difference in the world, I need more. I don't have enough. I need more time. I need more money, more friends, more strength, more resources. I, I've seen what you've given to others, Jesus. I, I need what they have. Sure, they can make a difference in the world, but that's because you made them special. You gave them stuff. And, and if you want me to make a difference, I just I need more than I have. It's too much. I can't do it. I don't have enough. I just ask you, how often has that been our response? We look around and, and we compare the size of the need to the capacity of our size. And we're thinking, God, you want me to do this? I don't have enough. John tells us that Jesus was testing Philip because he already knew what he was going to do. But first a test, <laughs> a test of faith. Jesus is testing Philip's trust in God's capacity. Bobby Clinton did a whole bunch of studies on, on leadership. And in a study of thousands of biblical, historical, and contemporary leaders, he, he suggested that this is a test, this faith test is a test that we often face when we start to come out of a time of transition. It, you've heard me say that this season that we've been in is, is not a temporary interruption in our story. It's a transitional disruption. It's like the white pages between the chapters of our story. And Clinton says that often when we come out of a transition, before the next chapter starts, God will test our faith. Jesus is testing Philip's faith. Philip, where can we get enough bread for the crowd? Jesus, it would take a small fortune. We don't have enough. See, Jesus is, taking from an, is asking Philip this question from an attitude of abundance, but, but Phil is answering with a mentality of scarcity. And I wonder how often we miss Christ's invitation to join him in a miracle because we think he's leaving the solution up to us. So we count our coins and we strategize our plans and we work up our, our, our gumption only to realize, yeah, we can't do that. Don't have enough. Can't give what we don't have. Jesus is looking for a yes and all we have is a yeah, but. You know, I think... Jesus was hoping Philip might say something like, well, let's see, Jesus. I watched you turn six pots of water into 768 bottles of fine wine. I was there when you healed that guy's son with just a word, long distance. And, and then there was that guy at the pool crippled for decades. He didn't know you were you, but you, you healed him and he walked. So, so let's see, Jesus, where are we going to get bread? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> Jesus, just tell me what you want me to do. I'm pretty sure you got this. I just don't want to miss it. And even today, right now, God is looking for people who believe that Jesus is more than enough for every person who comes our way with a need that we cannot meet. Can I, I just tell you another dollar story? When Toby was in high school, he wrote an essay on world hunger, and, and he ended up winning a two-week trip study tour to Africa through World Vision. When he was there, Toby was struck by the beauty and the poverty of Ethiopia. But if you were to talk to him shortly after he stepped off the plane on home ground, you would have found that one picture dominated his mind and heart. One, one day at a World Vision distribution camp in Ethiopia, he was handing out food and supplies and, and playing with some of the kids. And, and as Toby and the others were getting ready to leave, this 11-year-old boy tapped him on the shoulder. He was staring at Toby's t-shirt. And then the, the young boy looked down at his own shirt. It was worn and thin and full of holes. And, and he looked back at Toby and he asked kind of shyly, could he have Toby's t-shirt? So, uh, Toby wasn't prepared for that request. His luggage was a day away and, and fair skin minus t-shirt plus African sun was not a good equation. He didn't have very much time to think about it. The bus was leaving. He shrugged his shoulder shook his head no, and, and he stepped on the bus. But from that moment on, Toby could not get that picture out of his mind. And added to the picture was hearing Jesus' word, and whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers, you, you do to me, you do for me. 
Back home in Michigan, it was even worse when he counted how many t-shirts he had hanging in his closet and stuffed in his dressers. He had to do something. And so he started a t-shirt drive called Give the Shirt Off Your Back. He went door to door collecting t-shirts. He persuaded local 7-Elevens to put out collection bins. Local media picked up the story and pretty soon it seemed like everyone in Michigan had heard about Toby's campaign. In a few months, he collected over 10,000 t-shirts. Now, how does a high school student get 10,000 t-shirts to Ethiopia? He called one relief agency after another, same answer over and over and over again. Sorry, can't help, too expensive. He called UPS. Sure, they could do it for $65,000. Finally, someone connected him with an organization called Supporters of Sub-Sahara Africa, and they just happened to be taking a shipment of supplies to Africa, and they were willing to take Toby's t-shirts along for the ride, just one hitch, one condition, they could only take them to one African country, Ethiopia. <laughs> I mean, can you hear those five words again? More than enough. He's got more than enough. He'll give more than enough. He, he's a God of more than enough. He can do more than enough. So, so that's our second hope giver prayer request. Along with compassion that moves me, God, give me more capacity for faith. Give me faith and you're more than enough. I, I need more than enough faith. We, we see it again in John chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. Then Andrew, it says, Simon Peter's brother spoke up and said, there's a, a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks to God and he distributed them to the people. And afterwards he did the same with the fish and they all ate as much as they wanted. Now if you want to be a hope giver, keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the model. He's the example. But every once in a while someone else comes close and we catch a glimpse because God is always at work shaping our hearts to be more like the heart of Jesus. And, and so every once in a while, we, we catch a glimpse of Jesus in the heart of somebody around us. And in this case, that glimpse comes in the heart of a young boy with five barley loaves and two fish. We, we don't know much about him. But, but let me make a, a couple of guesses from the context. Barley was the bread of the poor. It's cheap grain. This is a poor community all surrounding this. The farmers are taxed heavily. Their land is frequently lost to the rich. This is not just a young boy. He's a young boy living in the margins of life. The, the word for fish indicates that it was probably more like a sardine than a freshwater trout. And this is probably all he's got. In fact, if he doesn't bring this home, his family probably goes hungry. When they ask him for his food, he, he doesn't know what Jesus is going to do. All he knows is is that he's being asked to give all that he has so that somebody else can eat. He's being asked to surrender his stuff for someone else's need. He has no idea. You understand, this kid has no idea that, that he's on the verge of being part of a miracle that will be told for thousands of years to billions of people. No idea that Jesus is going to take his poor boy sandwich and, and turn it into a feast for thousands. In fact, in the moment, think about this. When he's asked, faith probably feels more like an unfair burden than an invitation to a miracle. Seems more like a, a risk than a reward. You understand, sometimes, maybe often, giving the hope of Jesus requires the risk of faith, which often resembles surrender. And so here's the, the hope giver prayer request. God, would you give me courage to live with open hands? You know, Jesus never asks us to give what we don't have. He asks us to exercise the faith that gives what we have, knowing, even knowing that it's not enough. He asks us to trust his ability to produce more than enough. Look at verses 12 through 14. It says, After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather up the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and they filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely this is the prophet we've been expecting. Everyone was full. 5,000 men, counting women and children, was likely a crowd to fill the Bryce Jordan Center. Not, not just a taste to whet the appetite. They, they, they were full with, with 12 baskets of leftovers. 
You know, most of us have heard of Michael Jordan, one of the all-time great NBA players, but, but few of us have probably ever heard of Jack Haley. In the championship run of 1996, Jack was, was on the team. He was basically Dennis Rodman's babysitter. He, he played in one game that year. It was an easy victory for the Bulls. When Haley came in, the Bulls were leading by 30 points, and Michael Jordan had already scored 50 points. In the game while he was in, Jack scored one point. <laughs> Later in an interview, Haley said, I can't wait for the day. One day I will be able to tell my grandchildren about the day that Michael Jordan and I scored 51 points together. <laughs> A crowd of 15,000 plus people were fed that day. I used to wonder what happened to the leftovers, 12 baskets full. I used to think, man, I hope they marched those baskets to the home of that kid who took the risk of faith to live with open hands. But you know what? Maybe it doesn't matter who got the leftovers. Because that day wasn't about food. And, and for the rest of his life, this young man would be able to talk about the day that together, he and Jesus fed a crowd. And, and then I thought, and as the years went by, I hope that young man would come to realize that in the end, the best part wasn't even the adventure of feeding a crowd with Jesus. The best part was Jesus. That 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 was the day that he met Jesus, that that was the day when he found the bread of life that would satisfy the deepest hungers of his heart because in the end, Jesus is the heart of hope. The, the next day, that same crowd returned. They came looking for Jesus. Big surprise, huh? Like, hey, Jesus, what's for breakfast? And, and Jesus told them in John chapter 6, verses 26 through 27, he said, you, you've, you've come looking for me not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you, I filled your stomachs, and for free. Don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like that. Instead, work for the food that sticks with you, food that nourishes your lasting life, food that the Son of Man provides. And then a, a little bit later in verse 47, he says, I'm telling you the most solemn and sober truth now. Whoever believes in me has real life, eternal life. I am the bread of life. Man, such a bold claim. Arrogant if it's not true. In the end, we're all hungry. We just don't know what will satisfy our hunger. And Jesus says, it's me. And I'm more than enough. Jesus is more than enough. To every college student at the party, to every man or woman sprinting into the destruction of a midlife crisis, to those who have climbed the ranks of life and found nothing to satisfy your soul at the top of that mountain, to those who want to make a difference in their neighborhood, but you just don't believe that you have what it takes. Listen to me, Jesus is more than enough. And I'm not merely saying that he can do more than enough or that he has more than enough. I'm saying he is in and of himself more than enough. I'm saying that if you have Jesus and, and nothing else, you have more than enough. I'm saying what we need is more Christ, more capacity for Christ. We, we need to become students of Jesus, friends of Jesus, passionate followers of Christ. We need to dive so deep into Jesus that people can't find us without rubbing shoulders with him. He's the bread of life and he is more than enough. Just ask yourself, am I willing to stop filling up on spiritual junk food and let my soul be satisfied by Jesus? If, if it's necessary, will I let go of the good to go after God? Have, have I noticed the hunger pains that come from spending too long away from Jesus? Do I have a glorious, gut-wrenching hunger for Christ? And if not, read the Gospels. Be still. Ask the Spirit of God to open up the eyes of your heart. Carve out time. Shut out the noise. Surrender everything he asks. You'll, you'll always come out ahead. See, this is the most important prayer request of a hope giver. God, give me Christ. Sure, pray for compassion and courage and capacity and, and the ability to make a difference in your neighborhood. But if you forget all of that, but you never stop praying, God, give me more Jesus, more Jesus. God, give me more Jesus. You're going to find that he is more than enough. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I, I pray that right now in, in, in cars and, and homes and and places all over 
by your spirit, would you just awaken in us a deeper hunger for Jesus? Would you show us the, the junk food that we're feeding on? And what would you give us the courage to live with open hands, to surrender what, what, whatever you ask? God, not just for the, the, the opportunity, the adventure, the invitation to do something great with Jesus, but to find someone great in Jesus. God, deepen the hunger of our hearts. I, I pray that you would give us more Jesus. I, I pray that, that the church would be saturated with Jesus, that people wouldn't be able to, to, to get to know us without coming face to face with Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your deep desire to be known by us, to be treasured by us, to, to be in us, and for us to be in you. We, we ask that you would, you would help us to stop at nothing. <laughs> until we have more of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, listen to this song. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. And then come back and we'll close.
So let me ask you, what are you going to do this week to go harder after Jesus, to find the more than enough that Jesus is? If you do nothing, if all you did was listen to this, you've wasted your moments. But if you do something, be still. <laughs> Read the scripture. Ask the Spirit of God to, to make Jesus come alive in your life. And I'm telling you, you will find that Jesus is more than enough. Lynn, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Heavenly Father, I thank you that even as the song said, you are on our side. Mm. Forgive us for the times that we, we spin this narrative in our minds that you're against us. Yeah. Um, I pray in those be still moments that we would learn to place our hope and our trust in the God who is for us and yeah. the God who yeah. is on our side and the God who is able to bring much from little. Yeah. God, we just offer before you our little and we trust you to make it into the much that you have for us. So Lord, would you just breathe in hope, mm -hmm. breathe in your truth, breathe in the, the reality that you're always with us, that you're always on our side, yes, Lord. that you are a God who loves without limits. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you next week.